Welcome everyone to today's panel, an administrator's approach to bone grafting selection sponsored by Medtronic. Here are a few housekeeping items before we get started for this webinar. We will begin with a panel discussion and you will have time at the end to have your question and answers, questions answered, excuse me. You can submit any questions that you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box that you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link that you use to log into today's webinar to access the recording when it becomes available. But anytime you don't see your slides moving or having any issues with your audio, first try refreshing your browser. And then if you're still experiencing the problem, you can use the question and answer box that you see on your screen and someone will be able to assist you. Before I turn it over to the presenters, there are a couple important things to share with you all. The following presentation is on behalf of Medtronic and contains the opinions of and the personal surgical techniques practiced by Dr. Ronald Lehman. The patient images and other images are courtesy of him as well. Additionally, Dr. Lehman, Wendy Elliott, and Greg Mays are paid consultants for Medtronic. Consult product labels and inserts for indications, contraindications, warnings, and instructions for use. The webinar this evening is intended to educate and train customers regarding the approved or cleared uses for Medtronic products, and unapproved products or indications will not be discussed. If you have any questions, you can contact Medtronic's Office of Medical Affairs at the contact listed on the screen. Additionally, all content, including the presentation, is property of the presenters and Medtronic and protected by copyright laws. You may not copy, reproduce, distribute, modify, or in any way exploit any part of the presentation without written permission from the presenter or Medtronic previously. Be sure to stay tuned at the end where we will share additional resources for you as it pertains to what is discussed today. At this time, I am pleased to turn it over to Dr. Lehman, Wendy, and Greg for today's panel. Great, thanks, Megan. So my name is Ron Lehman. I'm a spine surgeon at the Ox Spine Hospital at Columbia University in New York Presbyterian in New York City. Um, you know, our experience and what we're going to talk about tonight is really um, the products about uh, there and surrounding bone grafting. You know, when I started as a intern over 20 years ago at this point, um, you know, the world has really completely changed in terms of how we approach, approach patients. Uh, things like RHBMP2 uh, came into vogue uh, after I'd already started training. Um, before that, we were using a lot of the patient's own bone for various reasons. However, I think as we've seen this continue to materialize over the years, um, it's really changed how we focus on the patient, but also how much better we understand the patient. Um, so from that perspective, I want to introduce our other two panelists. Uh, Wendy, we'll have you introduce yourself first, and then we'll go on to Greg. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Elliott. I'm the Assistant Vice President over the Marcus Neuroscience Institute, which is part of Baptist Health South Florida. Um, my experience with bone grafting, you know, obviously as a, I'm a clinician, but I'm not a spine surgeon. So, you know, I've been in the administrative world for um, quite a few number of years. So I've learned a lot, but, you know, from my experience, it's more about working with the physicians to determine what's the best product and what's the best outcome for patient care. So it's, I'm excited to be here tonight to present with all of you guys. Hey, thanks, Dr. Lehman. Uh, my name is Greg Mays. I'm the AVP of Medical Device and Procurement for LifePoint Health, which is an IDN based in Nashville, Tennessee, that owns about five, 56 acute care hospitals and other uh, health care facilities. Uh, my background, I've been in the medical device space for about 25 years. The last dozen or so has been uh, working in medical device. I've negotiated contracts for biologics and other devices, both at the national level and the local facility level. Um, previous to the, this role on the hospital side, though, I was actually a medical device rep for quite a few years. So I'm trying to use my experience from both sides. Glad to be here. Great. Thanks, Wendy and Greg. <clears throat> so I think you can see we have a, a really an amazing uh, panel of experts from both the administrative side all the way to the clinical side and sort of in between. So let's talk a little bit um, about this topic. So we know that bone grafting um, really comprises a lot of things. We have to really consider, you know, as we as uh, clinicians, when we do cases, we want to make sure that our first case or our primary case um, is sort of where we hit the home run, 
you know, because we know is for primary surgeries, they always have better outcomes than revisions. There's been many studies that have looked at this and you can see the forest plot on the left-hand side. What you really do first matters and it's important to try to get it right the first time. You know, with this sort of concept though also comes these sort of cost and value that we talk about when we think about using products um, in order to help achieve our clinical success. We know there are a lot of challenges. This is one of the many things that's really transformed over my 20 years uh, at this point in practice. There are challenges and issues with the patient. Uh, obviously patients who have comorbidities uh, such as uh, patients who are using anti-inflammatories, older individuals, or those who are vitamin D deficient, which has really been one of the hallmarks of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery over the last decade in their own the bone campaign is to really understand metabolic uh, bone disease. We certainly know this can be significantly affected and in nearly every study we've ever seen, patients who are currently smoking are really at the largest risk of not fusing or not healing after types of surgeries. In addition, we have to look about the site. There's some challenges that occur where we're gonna do the actual operation. No different in some of the indications that we have for trauma, uh, bones, long bones like the tibia don't heal as well, the scaphoid don't heal as well, the navigator and the foot don't heal as well because their blood supply is not very good. Similarly, the femur, uh, which is surrounded by a lot of muscle, heals quite well. And it's a little bit of a uh, paradox when we talk about you know, lumbar fusions and cervical fusions is that in areas where the blood supply is quite plentiful, that patient has a better chance of doing well. Other issues like radiation in the previous bed, that can be an issue, or bone quality and bone health in terms of osteopenia and osteoporosis are also important. And then lastly, we think about the procedure itself. You know, which operation are we going to do? Is it gonna be an anterior approach, a posterior approach? Um, how many levels, how large of a surgery is it going to be? All those things really significantly impact what we're going to do and how we're gonna think about applying some of these uh, products uh, to our surgery. We know that all these patients, like we just discussed, have different needs. And on the left-hand side, you can see that for a low-challenge patient, which means someone who's younger, healthier, doesn't smoke, and doesn't have comorbidities, and maybe a smaller surgery, well, they have a much better chance of doing well than the patient on the right-hand side who has significant comorbidities um, and issues. And the gaps for all these are significantly different, but also things that we have to keep in mind. So we're probably gonna throw the quote kitchen sink at the patient on the right-hand side to ensure that they have a much better chance to fuse and to heal than the patient on the left-hand uh, side of the graph, which may not need as much in terms of biologics, extenders, or bone grafting. We think of the, about this mostly based upon the patient because it's really one of the variables initially that we have to optimize before we consider doing anything. We wanna avoid a pseudoarthrosis or those patients who don't fuse uh, because we know that they're gonna have significant uh, morbidities uh, in the future as a result. Anytime we can decrease the chance of needing additional surgery, many studies over the last 20 years have shown that the quality of life for those patients or what we call qualies uh, are significantly improved if we don't have to do revision surgery. So even if it does require an, an additional expenditure for the primary or initial surgery, those can have significant cost savings uh, down the road. As a result, we wanna make sure that we select the perfect strategy for bone formation in these cases, and then think about which one supports our strategy. And this is gonna be different for all of us. If we do shorter surgeries, smaller surgeries, less levels, that's a much different um, point than if you're doing something that requires a much more highly active graft strategy as some of the cases that we'll highlight today. In addition, there are different categories. Um, and I think uh, you know, Greg will talk about this a little bit later on is we have to understand sort of what we're dealing with. We have things like synthetics on the left-hand side, Allograft, which is sort of one of our standard uh, products, uh, certainly in the United States and North America, but it's not the same uh, throughout many uh, countries throughout the world, including Asia, where there are different cultural norms. In addition, um, things that are uh, mixed with uh, cadaveric bone and tissue um, as well, like CBMs, or demineralized bone matrices or fibers, uh, which have a little bit more evidence in the literature with the uh, bone morphogenic proteins, which probably have the most robust literature of anything at this point in terms of clinical equipoise and clinical based evidence. We know from a couple of years ago that if we look at the different types of uh, procedures that are done, 
Uh, we obviously focus on spine because that's obviously my uh, area of expertise and where I practice, but we can look at other things. Uh, extremities uh, comprise the largest uh, subcategory of all the bone, bone growth and bone grafting procedures that are really done in the United States. Uh, primary hips and knees, uh, once again, comprise almost 10%, um, and then spine, you can see, um, is about 5%. So applications in terms of the trauma setting, in terms of extremities, are quite high, as well as oral maxillofacial surgery also has a large preponderance. So we've published uh, several studies uh, when I was in the military at Walter Reed, as well as here at Columbia and in St. Louis, uh, looking at bone health, uh, osteoporosis, and the different types of medications and how that really affects lumbar spine surgery. Um, it's one of the many things that we really have to keep in mind before embarking uh, on these ventures uh, for surgeries. Ultimately, we're always trying to balance cost versus outcomes. You know, it's interesting, over the last uh, four to six months, we've been working on a large project um, at New York Presbyterian, looking at things um, in terms of cost and what actually performs outcomes. And what I always, you know, teach and what I talk about, even with my partners, as well as my fellows and residents and trainees is, you know, what things actually have clinical efficacy. When we follow the literature and the clinically-based uh, studies and uh, clinically important evidence, I think that's what really should guide us. Um, as we'll discuss tonight, there are many different products on the market at this point, um, and we really need to understand you know, what those products um, rely. We have to take into account revision surgeries, different patient types like we talked about, and then what really is the quote cost of not fusing, the cost of the product, and a lot of the intangibles that go along with the patient not doing as well with a more poor quality of life, lower Oswest as Westry uh, disability indices scores and lowest, lower promise scores. One of the really interesting things over the last a year or two was the AO Spine Foundation came out with their own bone osteobiologics and evidence classification. And I think this is really important because it's essentially an independent organization that's looked at a lot of the types of products on the market, but also some that are specific uh, for different implants itself. If you look on the uh, right-hand side, the sort of, uh, in the human studies, the level one evidence is really the highest, obviously. And so no different than what we talk about in the clinical-based evidence, um, in that RHBMP2 really has the highest amount of evidence in the literature. Graft on DBM is sort of second, uh, followed by other products. The level one evidence, though, is, is pretty significant. Um, and these are studies that are prospective and randomized and uh, have been placed uh, through the FDA in terms of IDE studies uh, just initially. So we can see a lot of the spine fusion areas have been passed through, long bones in terms of tibia have passed through. And what's really important and interesting about the trauma applications is that 41% fewer secondary interventions and almost 30% fewer non-unions versus standard of care over a 12 month period. So this is pretty significant. Certainly additional surgeries, different returns to the OR, those are all incredibly important from that perspective. And you can see on the right-hand side how some of these products really form bone and which is demonstrated uh, optimally. Many of the products uh, are important. And so we really baseline things in terms of uh, autograph, which is sort of right here in the middle. And so if we look at this line, anything above that has a much better chance to do well Things below it don't work as well as a standard autograph. Magnifuse is at the very top. That has a factor of 3.5. You can see all the other products uh, near the top. So let's look at a couple examples in terms of spine cases. So this is a, an older uh, person uh, who is pretty debilitated. Um, as you can see uh, by the way they're standing, their knees are flexed. They're not able to stand upright. Uh, they're not standing with perfect alignment, and their head, you can see, is significantly forward of where their pelvis is. And so this is a patient who has significant disability, um, and one we're going to talk about the host, that they may need a lot more. We have a lot of different numbers that we uh, measure and sort of think about, and you can see the, some of the screws and rods here in these implants. So this patient had five or six prior surgeries, all of which sort of, quote, started as small, but now the issue is this patient developed a significant issue because of the prior surgeries. And so anytime we talk about this, about this revision type scenario where you've had four or five previous surgeries, we sort of have a rule in our center that at this point, if we're doing a major revision surgery, our goal is that not only does the patient do well, but we decrease the need to have another surgery because I think that's incredibly important. This patient's been through this multiple times 
as a result, it's not just affecting uh, this individual, it affects their spouse and family members, all of which uh, are certainly important for us to take and consider. We can see here on the CAT scan, there's a significant amount of bone that's being formed by the yellow arrows. Um, in addition, this patient has significant degeneration right above the previous level. So all these things I think are important to consider. They have formed bone in their previous surgeries, but now they need a lot more and the host is not the same as it was the first time. So we do major reconstructions like this. We can see here, we place a lot of rods and a lot of screws uh, on the side of the patient. Um, these go to help in, improve the stability. And then we can use products in this particular instance like Magnafuse, which is highlighted here by the yellow arrow, which is the mineralized bone fiber, but it over, also overlies uh, this uh, clinical uh, defect or laminectomy defect where we decompress the neural elements and allows adhesion of the bone uh, to graft from that area. And so after a more major reconstruction like this uh, with a better alignment uh, from the front um, as well as from the side, this patient goes on to have a much more uh, livable life, uh, doing much better with a significantly improved quality than what they had previously. In addition, another case where they've already had a larger surgery. And so this patient had an eight level fusion, but as you can see here from the yellow arrow, they're starting to develop what we call kyphosis, which is where their top of their thoracic spine or the middle of their back starts to fall forward. And so proximal junctional kyphosis is a very uh, um, significant issue when we do any of these larger type constructs. They develop a, a degenerative disc disease and adjacent segment degeneration. And now it becomes much more significant because we know we're going to have to extend this patient all the way up to the top of the thoracic spine. So they're going to end up with a 17 or 18 level fusion. Once again, when we look at the CT scan, we can see how much kyphosis they're developing, almost 72 degrees right here in the middle as we measure but they really have a significant problem right at the very top above their previous instrumentation. So now we have to take into consideration, once again, what does this host and patient need in terms of biologics and what can we do to optimize this patient so that they can decrease the chance for needing an additional surgery? So here's a 3D CT rendering of what this construct looks like. And once again, this is a much more significant case. We're, not, we're gonna have to do a lot more surgery um, and so as we talked about in the initial slides, this is going to be a patient where we're probably going to throw the kitchen sink at them to make sure that we can optimize their chance of doing well and ultimately fusing. So we can see here after the major reconstruction to the upper part of the thoracic spine, this patient is standing much more straight. We have them better aligned and we have them much more stable. And ultimately, this patient is going to do well because we've also maximized the amount of bone graft and bone graft material we've used to really try to optimize their overall plan of care. So at this point, you know, as we really tried to highlight initially, we have a couple different scenarios where we have to think about when we're selecting a bone graft. And really, what type of bone graft are we using? You know, how do we choose that? what evidence is there really to support um, that? And as, as a physician and clinician, um, how do we go about uh, doing this? So I think at this point, what we're gonna do is, um, you know, really um, delve into the expertise of the panel to talk about a lot of these different scenarios, uh, because we know that from a clinician side point, a standpoint, you know, we have the ability to understand the patient Although we don't have a perfect understanding, you know, we have this, what we call an optimization uh, of our patients where we really try to ensure that their bone health is uh, well, meaning that if they have things like osteopenia or osteoporosis, that can we do something that will help affect change from that perspective, uh, even ahead of time in terms of seeing endocrinology, starting on medications. Uh, but then ultimately, when this patient goes to surgery, we know that if their bone quality isn't as good and potentially there's some medical comorbidities like you know, renal disease or kidney disease, or they have vitamin D deficiency, or they've had a previous surgery, we're gonna have to go a little bit further to the right-hand side to increase our biologic activity. So at this point, um, let's talk about this maybe really from the grassroots. You know, uh, Wendy and Greg, you know, as we were talking uh, before and over the last uh, few weeks, you know, I, from my standpoint as a, as a surgeon and physician, you know, I'm looking at the patient, I'm evaluating, you know, those basic things. 
um, when I go into the OR, I have you know several plans as to uh, what I want to do from that perspective um, and how I think I'm going to accomplish that. And those are all well and good, but what it really comes down to is you know what should I use? And so when you're looking um, at your facilities in terms of you know how do we approach it from an administrative standpoint where we have you know 19 let's just say spine surgeons who come to you and we say we want to use 19 different products uh, we all like a certain different one because that's the way sort of we were trained and that's what we think works uh, what are some of the ways initially that you have the products um, um, come in or out of your facilities maybe wendy we'll start with you what are your thoughts about how you evaluate these from an administrative uh, standpoint in terms of, you know, balancing clinical equipoise uh, versus mm -hmm. what makes, you know, quote, cost sense uh, for, for these types of things. Sure. Well, first of all, great presentation. Thank you so much from the clinical side. It's always important to get the, the patient aspect of, of things. From an administrative side of things, and I think Greg and I have a bit of different experiences. You know, he's more on the supply chain and I'm more in the clinic working in, you know, in the hospital working with the surgeons to determine, you know, what it is that they need. So, you know, I rely heavily on the expertise of my providers and the ones that are doing the surgery, but also doing due diligence in, in looking at the clinical evidence of each and all of the, the products that we use. We started out, you know, in my experience where I am currently, we started out with like 36 different providers and each of them having their own type of, you know, bone grafting or product to utilize. So we wanted to make sure that we had the best product and it wasn't just about the relationship that the physician had with the representative that was working with them. And that's always an important thing to look at is, you know, the relationships are important because they really, the surgeons, as you know, Dr. Lehman rely a lot on the reps that come into the surgical suite with you, but also making sure that the the product that we're using is the best evidence based product for the surgery that we're doing. So, you know, we look at it very specifically, we evaluate it and we utilize our experts, which are the surgeons to be able to tell us, you know, what are the what are the products that are showing the best results. And where we are, you know, we do have a spine coordinator who looks at all the outcomes and we do, you know, long-term, you know, long-term results with our patients to see, you know, how they're progressing and how the recovery is, you know, so for us, it's, it's, like I said, initially, when I introduced myself, it's, it's more about the patient outcomes and how we're looking at them, but also keeping it at, um, at a manageable opportunity for all the products that we have, because we can't use every single one of the products that are out there because they expire, they're sitting on our shelves and you know our physicians aren't all using them. So we wanna get the majority of the utilization of it and get the best products in there. Yeah, so I, I echo a lot of what you just said, but uh, I think from an administrative or even a contracting standpoint, what administrators really need to kind of uh, learn is, is what I call the buckets. It was one of your previous slides, Dr. Lehman. Um, a lot of these products do have categories, or I always call them buckets, that you can pretty much group them into. And so if you can understand you know, the bone and chips, the basic bone, the DBMs, the synthetics, um, even the stem cell category, or the mesenchymal cell set category, if you want to go there, all the way up to the, to the bone mineral proteins. So try to educate yourself, use your resources, uh, go to a national meeting, or uh, even use resources like Becker's that I do quite a bit. Um, so once you know that, you realize that when a new product is brought in, what is it like? What, what does it fit into? What do we have on the shelf already? And do we really need something else um, in addition to that? The only difference may be maybe some handling characteristics um, or, or something other the way it's delivered. So Greg, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you an interesting question, more based upon your history and what you've all done, uh, what you've done over the last uh, several decades. But so if I'm a um, if I'm a rep and I'm trying to bring a product, you you were in medical medical devices initially, and so if you're um, you know you're a rep and you're starting out, you're you know 25 years old and you're you're excited, you met with a surgeon and you presented a product to them, and um, they have some interest, um, but obviously you're excited to you know get it in their hands and hopefully start helping patients. Um, how does that differ in terms of your approach then 
versus your approach now being quote on the other side where you're looking at things differently. So maybe talk us through a little bit if you're starting out in this injury industry and you do have a product that you think works, you know, how do you present that to the physician? How do you present that, you know, even to the administrators in the hospital? Because, you know, we often go back and forth and we're, we'll get a, we'll get an email from the head of the OR, like, you know, someone, you know, brought this product, said you want to use it. Um, and obviously they're, they may be pushing a little bit hard from that perspective uh, versus once again, your experience now and, you know, sitting on the other side of the fence, I guess, for lack of a better term, in terms of how you're going to evaluate that. So maybe talk to us a little bit in the bi-directional nature um, of this presentation from someone starting out compared to where you're at now. Yeah, great question. So uh, I would say uh, the industry has matured quite a bit or the expectation is that it's matured. Um, back 15, 20 years ago, um, it was, I would say a little bit easier to, to, to walk something in and get a physician to, to advocate for you with, without a whole lot of barriers. Um, from an administrator, standpoint, my expectation of rep representatives is to be professional. Is to, if you're going to bring something to a physician and to a facility, uh, bring us the cl clinical evidence, produce the part numbers, uh, Excel spreadsheet with pricing, how many CCs it is by, by each other. Give us as much detail as well. Treat us with respect as a professional and we'll treat you with the same. And we'll at least give a good evaluation. Uh, but getting a physician stirred up and uh, demanding something uh, no matter what without much backing. There's nothing a CFO or a COO uh, dislikes more than a physician coming to their door and throwing something down on the desk saying, I've got to have this or else. So you've got to manage that kind of relationship both on the administrator side and the physician side. It's nuanced, um, but if you really do have a product that's got the clinical value and the clinical ad, a facility is going to want to add it to their formula, add it to their, to their ability to, to provide a doctor because we want to take good care of patients. We just don't want to pay uh, more for something that's just like everything else or just the same thing to have one extra thing on the shelf. So I think as a professional, you can you can differentiate yourself by acting that way. Yeah, maybe Wendy then, also, you know, go ahead, sorry. No, go ahead. What were you, were you going to say? No, I was going to say exactly from, from your standpoint and as you sort of, um, you balance, you know, both of these sides obviously quite well. Mm -hmm. And so in the same scenario, if you have someone come to you and says, you know, as well as a physician for that matter, um, you know, we want to use, you know, this particular product, you know, what do you look at from that perspective? And, um, you know, how does that go through the process um, in your facilities to be able to basically bring something onto, you know, the formulary for lack of a better term? Well, what I, I'm grinning here because those of you out there that are watching this that know me know that you know, one of the things that I'm like very adamant about is the the reps coming into or emailing me and saying, I need to have an answer because I've talked to the physician and they want this now. I mean, that's that's not how I, I work. You know, the physicians have a great relationship with me and they know that they, they need to come to me and they need to like talk about this new product and talk about why this is important for us to have and what's the difference. So you know, for us, you know, I rely heavily on my physician experts, like I said before, but they know that they can come to me and they can say, you know, this is a great product. This is why it's great. There's evidence on this. This is different than what we currently use. And then we have a procedure. We have a procedure in our facility that if it is something that's different than we have currently, then we take it up through the committee, surgical committee that will look at this, which is clinical as well as administrative. And from a clinical perspective, we want to see all the things that Greg had talked about. You know, what's evidence-based? Why is it different than what we currently have? Why should we use it? And then from an administrative standpoint, if it is different than any of the contracts or any of the products that we already have, then how, you know, how can we make this work? And is it, you know, priced out at a point where it's not going to add any additional costs that's not worth it? to the surgical component of our length of stay or DRGs or any of the things that we look at when we look at, you know, what what is it that improves the patient care component of it, but also, you know, makes a difference in, in the outcomes from a long-term perspective. It may not impact patients from a length of stay. You know, we're all length of stay fatigued. It's like every product that's out there is going to decrease the length of stay. But from a long-term perspective, are they ever going to come back for another surgery? Are they ever going to come back for complications with this? So looking at it that way, I think is important. Yeah, I would actually echo on top of that, just like I spoke about expectation of professionalism with the reps, we, we need to expect the same from the physicians. 
Uh, they're, they're scientists. We should, you know, uh, hope that they would bring information to us from a scientific mm -hmm. basis and a clinical evidence basis, and not just because we want, we have to. And that's why you have to have some sort of value analysis committee, like you talked about, um, that's, that's in place for us to, uh, and, and, a, and a structure very well defined, so they know, okay, if you're going to bring something in, you need to have this type of information. Here's the process. You need to attend or at least write something up so that we you can submit your opinions and that kind of thing and treat us like professionals. Um, I will say that kind of filters out a certain percentage of the requests anyways. If they've got to actually go through some hurdles to, to get the product they want, it, mm -hmm. it really filters down to the products they really want, and it's not just everything. And they have to, you know, we, we have to have a clinical champion, obviously, that's going to take it through the committee and, and do exactly what Greg said, you know, present it and present the evidence and the science around it. But they also have to convince from an administrative lead to be able to take it through that. So we have to have the clinical champion and the administrative lead that's going to, like, um, make the full component of what it is that is appropriate for patient care. And yeah, just so bring one more point. project, Lemon. Yeah, please. Just to add on to that real quick, uh, one other thing that we make sure we add is uh, we ask for physician disclosures, um, just to disclose any sort of conflict of interest or uh, any relationship they might have with the product. Um, I don't know if anybody's been to clinical meetings before, but usually the disclosure slide is the first slide, so they're very used to that kind of thing, even though it's the fastest slide in every presentation. So that, uh, that also filters out quite a bit of stuff if it's not appropriate. Yeah, I think that brings up a lot of uh, great points that we can certainly dive into. You know, the first thing is that, um, you know, when I was in uh, St. Louis and certainly now in New York, when we want to uh, bring a product into our hospital as clinicians, one of the things that changed uh, even when I was there and, you know, it's sort of small world things because the uh, uh, physician in charge of perioperative care was my previous chairman of general surgery when I was at Walter Reed. And so it was one of those things, it was like this full, full circle Unfortunately, he took on a different role because he was sort of, uh, you know, holding the, the keys to the kingdom at that point. So everything sort of had to go through him. Um, and his approach was very transparent. And I think that's one of the things, Greg, you've, you've spoken about a lot um, in getting to know you about these uh, types of issues is that um, it was, you know, basically write us a one page uh, document that says why you think this product is beneficial. What's the clinical um you know, scientific component um, to it as well. Uh, sort of, you brought up. We want to really put on our, you know, scientist hat as a clinician. Um, and there's no doubt. Uh, and I know from both of you that you do independent searches as well. You do Google searches. Uh, you look at, you know, product information um, to say, you know, does it really work? Um, and so after we write that up, we submit it. And then, you know, once again, they keep tabs. And because if I submit 92 things, you know, nine weeks in a row, they're going to say, well. Why is Dr. Lehman trying to get all this different stuff in the formulary? Um, and so obviously, like anything else, you know, in our system, like in any system, we have to submit a conflict of interest. And, you know, one should never have a ability to have remuneration, you know, from bringing a product onto the formulary. Um, and we have to sign very strict disclosures about that. A lot of us do design things uh, that help us with surgery um, and various uh, components. But what we want to make sure um, that uh, that's important. Um, and so as we go down, you know, through this sort of pathway, um, I think it's always interesting to look at that uh, from that perspective. And I think it's, you know, really important. We're getting a lot of actually questions uh, in the chat board. And so uh, certainly continue to submit your questions and we'll continue to uh, sort of go over these um, as we do it. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting, this large uh, initiative that I've started at our hospital system um, is really looking at clinical equipoise. Um, so we sent out surveys to uh, our spine surgeons a few weeks ago, um, and we asked them about various products. You know, which one do you think works the best? Um, and as you can well imagine, with you know, 19 different things on the market that are all in the same you know bucket, as uh, Greg you talk about, um, it was all over the map, right? And so it really um, I think highlighted the fact that we, no one really knew exactly what the evidence was. You know, we sit down and we talk about things. Um, to say, okay, what are the studies, you know, what actually is proven? And then you re-rank things in terms of what has clinical efficacy. Um, and what's really interesting then is you look at some of the prices, you know, the hospital's paying. Different systems are different in terms of how they get reimbursed. Um, and, um, you know, I'm going to bring up uh, one of the questions here that Chris asked, uh, just because I think it really pertains here. He really asked, you know, how does insurance dictate which bone graft you use? 
Um, one of the things that we found out in every hospital system is different, every state's different, every insurance company pays differently. We, for the most part, get paid on a DRG for the large portion of our cases. Um, and so if we're doing a surgery and we're using implants that cost X, uh, you know, dural sealants that cost Y, and bone grafts and bone graft extenders, which cost Z, and the more of those that you use, the more expensive it's going to be for the surgery and the more that comes off the bottom line. You know, things like total joint arthroplasty now are paid, you know, basically purely on a DRG. So the hospital gets a sum of money that includes not just the surgery, the inpatient stay, the medications, but also the post-operative rehab and therapy. Um, so we really have to continue to, you know, think about this, um, not just from the administrative standpoint, but also from the physician standpoint, because we're our, our own stewards um, of making sure that we're doing the right thing for the right for the patient. Um, and as we've spoken about before, my general motto is if you do the right thing for the right person, for the right reason, you know, everything's going to work mm -hmm. itself out. But if you have the choice of two products and we know from evidence-based medicine that they basically work the same and one is three times more expensive, I think it's important for us to choose the product that's more cost effective um, to achieve the same outcome. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that uh, this has really sort of enlightened me about. And it's no different from a lot of the committees that uh, both of you are involved with to look at these products. Um, you know, in New York City, space is a premium. And so one of the amazing things uh, that we did in our end uh, just within the last couple of months is we've cut down our storage um, by taking things mm -hmm. off the market and off the shelf that we don't need. Um, we had an issue, we're having an issue right now where we're having a lot of a certain thing expire. Um, and so it's going to mm -hmm. expire in a week. And if it's not used, that's, you know, dead sum. We've lost that money. And I think, Greg, you brought it up, too, to make sure, you know, when we're looking at uh, products on the shelf to ensure that they're being used in a timely fashion and constantly going back and forth. What procedures do you have in your hospitals that look at ensuring that we're actually using things that are um, on the shelf, they're not expiring, and ensuring that we resupply the things that are being used more commonly? What are your basic uh, ways to do that to ensure you don't get in situations like we're currently in? Uh, well, we uh, do have certain policies where if things are walked in off the off the uh, street, um, not approved, not gone through process, we just won't pay for them. Um, it's just a, a developed a reputation and reps hopefully know that unless they go through our approval process, uh, nothing comes it's just in the hospital on the back door. Um, but also back to the reimbursement side, um, you're right, most of our, our procedures are DRG, but I've seen the negative version of that. Where there's certain products, certain stem cells that certain companies, Blue Cross in particular, will not, they will not pay for cases. They will take away certain, take away certain uh, parts of the DRG. But that's where we kind of love to use our physician panels. We've been had a lot of success, kind of like what you described, either the facility or the, the large uh, market or IDN level is getting these physicians in the same room. Because you'd be amazed, they talk all the time in the doctor's lounge, but they don't talk about the science. And I love to hear them go back and forth. It's just, it's lovely, great to be a fly on the wall. And you, you feel like these physicians have turned back into residents again, where they really do get into things and share best practices and talk about it. And it's amazing how they can come to consensus where in, in those kinds of situations. That, that's my favorite part of that. I think one of the things that we've tried to do, and, and Greg, you probably have done this too from a contracting standpoint, is, you know, we, we circle through our products. So if we have products on the shelf that aren't necessarily being used, then they'll take them off and then they'll use them somewhere that may be using that product a little bit more. One of the things we try and do is to make sure that we have a consensus from our physicians that the products that they want to use, you know, the, the one-off physician who wants to use this product and, and we have to get like a certain amount of it, we, we try and encourage them to not necessarily, you know, do that anymore and and we've been real successful in terms of getting a consensus of the products so we stock the ones that we utilize the majority of and we have in the contracts that they'll rotate the stock so we don't have anything that's expiring that we lose money on um, the other thing that it prompted you know the conversation was prompted me on is you know the my last facility i had 31 spine surgeons and so you can imagine the amount of product that they all like to use, but we brought them all into a room and we said, you know, here's the products, here's what we have. You know, they all have their 
their uh, favorites and the ones that they're loyal to because that's what they've always used, or they have their, you know, the distributors who have multitudes of products, but they like the distributor because, you know, they work well with them. But we, we made them set through presentations and looking at every single product that we had, including bone graft, but every single product to come to a determination as there, there, is there really that much of a difference in terms of what you're using and what, you know, what other people are using and can we look at the cost effectiveness of this? Like Craig said, you know, some of the products are much more expensive. So if there's really no scientific difference in it, then why would we want to increase our costs? Because we do have scorecards for all of our physicians and we do look at, you know, the procedures that they do and what they utilize for it. And if you're doing the same procedure and your costs are here and the other person's costs are here, then what is that differentiating component? Is it product? Is it time? Is it other things? So, you know, we, we do have committees that look at that and, and share information with their physicians on that. You know, but, but I think when we talk about this broader category, you know, what have we really learned from, you know, maybe the experts in this area in our hospital systems, the pharmaceutical um, and pharmacies, right? So pharmacies really have things uh, down. And, you know, one of the um, issues that I've had in our system when we first moved here seven years ago is there was a certain uh, product um, that I wanted to use clinically because it had some pretty good evidence, uh, not in spine, but in other things. And they basically said, well, we looked at it five or six times and we didn't think it was, you know, clinically efficacious. And so I'm like, well, I, you know, okay, you're a pharmacist. You know, I'm a clinician scientist and I think it is this. And within, you know, an hour, they basically sent me 62, you know, peer reviewed publications that says, you may think it works, but it doesn't work. We've been through this five or six times. Um, and Wendy, from your perspective, I know uh, one of the things that you've brought about is, you know, in terms of pricing and how good the pharmacy is in looking at mm -hmm. some of these things in terms of e e efficacy and how it uh, compares to clinical equipoise. Um, what things do you think we can learn from the pharmacy department when we talk about procurement from, um, you know, uh, bone products and uh, bone grafting type products? Well, I love what you just said about, you know, it doesn't work. One of the things that we've learned from the pharmacy department, because we're going through, you know, some edifications with some of the drugs that we would like to use for our spine surgery, and I won't mention it, but because most of the studies have been done by the pharma company, our pharmacy team is like, well, it's not, it's not impactful. So one of the things I think that we've learned from that is that if there's only studies that are done by the company or by the company, corporation that produces the product, the bone graft, then is that really something that we want to rely on? So are there any independent studies that look at, you know, some of the bone grafts and the outcomes from that, is, I think is the number one. But, you know, learning from from our pharmacy colleagues in terms of the P and T committees and how, you know, how they really look at, you know, the evidence-based components of it, I think that, you know, looking at any product and particularly bone grafting products in general, we can really learn a lot from them and, and, you know, bringing it to their attention and bringing it through our VAT committees or those types of things and looking at the efficacy of what's happened and the cost component of it. Because again, like you said, Dr. Lehman, it's like, you know, you have products that are, you know, just as expensive, but not showing the evidence of that. Yeah, Greg, if so I may add, this ex oops, yeah, please go sorry, ahead. Dr. Uh, I was just going to say, just back to the pharmacy example, I think that's a great example because they don't just go through approval and evidence base. They also ask right. how is it being used and how much is being used. I think that's a big point that needs to be made in this biologic space. Mm -hmm. So physicians ask yeah, and sometimes for Yeah, biologics, it's, it's like more is not necessarily better. It's yeah. like, you know, let's just throw it all in there because more is better. And we ended up, you know, we end up spending, you know, triple the amount of what is actually uh, well, needed. And there's... One product that's kind of, I won't name it, but it's out there now, it's got some decent cervical studies um, and that's great. So if you approve it, it's pretty expensive for the cervical. Next thing you know, they're using it in the lumbar space where there's no clinical evidence right. and there's, there's a ton of volume that's gonna be used there and the expense just goes through the roof. So it's not just about approval, it's approval about how and how much as well too. That's, that's gotta be part of the discussion. And a more, more general question, <clears throat> not, a, not a specific answer, but um, how long is the approval process in your facilities really from first request until product use um, in general terms? So, you know, once again, a, a, 
you know, someone comes to you, a physician, you know, writes something up, submits it. Um, just say your um, VAT meeting uh, or VAT meeting is the next day. Um, and uh, the group decides that this makes sense to bring this on to, you know, your formulary for use. How long would that take then at that point? I think if you ask our physician, it takes forever. Um, but we do have a process, like you said, if, if it gets into, into the committees on an appropriate, you know, in an appropriate amount of time, you know, when they vet it and they approve it, you know, the approval of the product, once they present it and they, they present the scientific evidence and everyone's on board, that takes a limited amount of time because if they get to the meeting and it goes forward, what takes time is developing the contract developing, you know, the product requirements and, and all of the procurements through our supply chain. So that could take a month or two, you know, depending upon, you know, what the pricing is and if there's any negotiations with that. So, you know, we hope that bringing a new product to market will be within three to four months. Uh, again, it just depends on, you know, what the, what the pricing component of it is. Uh, from our standpoint, it's uh, we expect the 30 days. Once the information is submitted, we have a monthly meeting at our facilities. Uh, the only time it would take longer is if it was a high impact item that we weren't really sure we wanted on our our company across facilities. It would then want to need to roll up for another 30 days to a to a national committee, which that does happen every once in a while for some controversial products. So, 30 to 60 days, but to me the longest time it takes um, is getting the information together from the vendor. That's where we need to expect a professionalism there. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, once again, interesting. There's a couple of quick questions we can get to. Julie asked, uh, do we take into account human studies versus animal studies? And I think like most things, you know, human studies are going to be the highest order, certainly if they're level one or level two uh, studies compared to animal studies. But a lot of, um, you know, the, all of us who have done research and do a lot of research uh, also understand that human studies are very difficult to conduct, obviously, unless you're doing an IDE study. And animal studies or preclinical studies do give us a lot of information not always extrapolatable to uh, humans, but I think a lot of it, what comes out in terms of uh, biologics and adherence and bone formation, I think give us, you know, quite a bit indication. And having done a lot of uh, animal studies myself, they take a lot of work. Um, so I do think you get some uh, pretty good information. Um, but I think once again, if you're doing, you know, living studies as opposed to stuff uh, just in, uh, in the Petri dish, uh, those are gonna have higher uh, clinical efficacy. Um, another uh, question, I think, which is really interesting, uh, Miriam asked this question, uh, and I'll ask this to you, Wendy. If you're presented with a new synthetic bone filler with higher or same efficacy based on clinical evidence, but less expensive than the rest that you have currently on your formulary, would you suspect the quality because it is cheaper? Would you be suspect of it? Interesting, uh, interesting thought. Yeah, I mean, well, that? that's always a question because, you know, usually the industry looks at itself and says, you know, what's, you know, what's out there, what's the pricing, and they're, they're usually comparable. So again, I would go to my experts, you know, my physicians and looking at the evidence and the research around it uh, and, and making a decision that way. Cheaper is not always bad, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't do your due diligence just like you would with everything else. Great. Um, another question uh, just talks about, you know, payers, um, like we talked about, a lot of uh, payments now are based upon a DRG. Some insurers do reimburse for certain products, but I think, Greg, that you brought up this point before, and we have really seen a difficult time, independent of this particular topic, over the last year or two, uh, payers are becoming incredibly, uh, are really scrutinizing what we do. We have cases where some insurers will only approve certain implants, certain cages, certain bone grafts. Um, and they won't often even give you the list of what they approve. You basically have to continue to submit your clinicals and hope that it pops up. And so, you know, this entire, I think, market or arena is going to continue to become more, unfortunately, focused and much more difficult. Um, but I think that's also why it's important that you follow the evidence, you know, follow the research studies, um, because I think if you use a product of whatever nature um, and you have good science behind it, you have a much better chance of, of the insurance companies catching on um, because most likely the more this continues to go to quote bundled payments and DRGs are essentially bundled payments in different forms. 
um, they don't really care. They're going to pay X amount anyway. And who's going to care the most are, you know, the hospitals and hospital administrators. And I think that's where, you know, we as physicians and surgeons have to keep that in mind because, you know, the world is, you know, changing. Everything's becoming more scrutinized. Uh, the profit margins obviously are decreasing. Um, and so if we can use a product that has uh, clinical equipoise with everything else on the market, but it ends up being less expensive, and I think it really almost beholdens us to uh, do that. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to uh, Megan. Uh, from my perspective, I uh, want to thank Megan and um, uh, Laura from Becker's uh, for allowing us to speak about this incredibly important topic, uh, but also looking at the cost effectiveness and value of this topic, I think, which is different for a lot of us uh, from the clinician standpoint, but something uh, that I've grown to understand a lot better even over the last six to eight months. Uh, I want to thank uh, Greg and Wendy as well uh, for your expertise and really helping me grow and understand a lot uh, in this space. Um, I think that's going to be incredibly valuable uh, for me moving forward. So at this point, I'll turn it back over to uh, Megan uh, for some closing remarks. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lehman, Wendy, and Greg for sharing your insight and experiences with the attendees this evening. As Dr. Lehman mentioned, there are a couple of QR codes on the screen for additional resources um, for you. The first one is um, a QR code where you can find additional product information um, by scanning it and it'll take you to medtronic.com slash fusion. And it'll also allow you to gain access to the masterclass series. You can learn how to overcome bone grafting challenges and spine surgery by watching masterclass series led by faculty experts. The second QR code will allow you to stay up to date by registering for online classes offered by Medtronic Spine Academy, which detail the latest developments in the business of spine care, coding, changes, regulations, and documentation requirements. Medtronic offers these classes free of charge throughout the year. So scan that to learn more. And then finally, you can use that final QR code um, to contact rs.biologics at medtronic.com for more information or if you'd like to learn about the Spine and Biologics Customer Experience Program. It's our customer facing focus program where we can um, interact with you and you'll interact with Medtronic internal experts, view demonstrations, and gain valuable education on products and services. So again, we want to thank you all for joining us this evening and cannot thank uh, Dr. Lehman, Greg, and Wendy enough for their insights. We hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening.